Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's special guest is a veteran actor whose prolific body of work over the past five decades has created some of the most memorable roles in movies, on television, and on the Broadway stage. On the big screen, he brought us Chief George Earl in Demolition Man, Mr. Pease in Dolores Claiborne, Pritchett in Broken Arrow, Medical School Dean Dr. Walcott in Patch Adams, Cecil Dobbs in The Lincoln Lawyer, and Secretary of State Cyrus Vance in Argo. But the one role more than any other that has guaranteed him cinematic immortality is his <laughs> chilling portrayal of the despicable prison warden Samuel Norton in The Shawshank Redemption. On television, in addition to many guest appearances on shows like Miami Vice, LA Law, CSI, Nip Tuck, Boston Legal, Law and Order SVU, The Blacklist, and dozens more. He played Governor George Wallace in Unconquered. He played Tommy Dorsey in the 1992 miniseries Sinatra. He played President Woodrow Wilson in Iron Jawed Angels. He played President Nixon in Elvis Meets Nixon. And he played President Roosevelt twice, once in the TV movie Kingfish, A Story of Huey P. Long, and again in the miniseries World War II, Behind Closed Doors. He also had recurring roles as Dr. Leonard Schrader on Hot House, Judge Homer Conklin in Courthouse, Mayor Smith in Peacemakers, Noah Taylor in Desperate Housewives, the Secretary of Defense, then Chief of Staff, then Secretary of State Ethan Kanan on 24, Leland Owsley in Daredevil, General William Collins in Royal Pains, and Jeremiah Davis in Trial and Error. And if all of that weren't enough, our guest is a Broadway superstar. He originated the role of Juan Perón in the Broadway premiere of Evita, receiving a Tony Award nomination and a Drama Desk Award for Outstanding Featured Actor in a Musical. And he played the title role in the Broadway revival of Sweeney Todd, earning a second Tony Award nomination and nominations for an Outer Critics Circle Award and a Drama Desk Award. His other Broadway credits include King of Hearts, for which he received a Drama Desk Award nomination for Outstanding Featured Actor in a Musical, How I Got That Story, for which he won an Obie Award, a Clarence Derwent Award, and a Drama Desk Award nomination for Outstanding Actor in a Play, Big River, for which he received a Drama Desk Award nomination for Outstanding Featured Actor in a Musical, and The Great Ostrovsky, for which he received a Barrymore Award nomination for Excellence in Theatre. I'm delighted to welcome the one and only Bob Gunton to our show. Mr. Gunton, thank you so much for being here. Oh, you've made me exhausted. I had forgotten half of those credits. Well, I haven't. You know, the, thank you for your scholarship. I read that you initially studied for two years to be a priest, even though you'd been performing on stage throughout high school and you really enjoyed it. What turned you away from the priesthood? Well, it'd probably be better to start with what attracted me, because it ended up being what made me decide to go away. Some of the most influential people in my early life were priests. And uh, fortunately, I didn't run into any of the uh, bad guys at all. They were all wonderful people. And uh, also, I was the eldest in an all-Catholic family, the, and the eldest boy is either a politician, a cop, or an actor. And so I chose the actor thing. And, I mean, uh, uh, the priest is the third third choice, uh, which I eventually abandoned. But, that, you know, I've, I've thought about that a lot. And I think there's something about the Catholic Mass that is maybe the most dramatic drama that takes place every day across the world in that a priest who gets into costume goes up on the stage the altar the sanctuary and commands christ and in, in the belief of the catholics to come down and be in front of them and eventually to be consumed all of that to me is tremendously dramatic and it can only we talk about temporary suspension of disbelief in theater, that is that takes the greatest temporary suspension of disbelief. Anyway, it was a theatrical setting. I kept doing 
shows even when I was in the seminary during the summer and uh, I got bit and I got bit hard, especially uh, I did a show in Tennessee, a little town called Crossville. And I was for several summers, the star. And uh, I have to say I was seduced into saying, you know, I think I'd be a hell of a lot better of an actor than a priest. And uh, so I consulted with uh, the men with whom I were I was studying, and <laughs> they agreed. So I left. I, I still uh, am connected to the order of Paulist Fathers. I've done one movie for them, uh, Judas and Jesus, and a couple of other projects too. And some of my best friends remain some uh, Paulist Fathers. What did your family think of your decision to pursue a career in show business? About the same thing that as they thought about my initially deciding to go to the seminary. Uh, it, they didn't they didn't wait one or the other. It was if that's what you want to do, you know, we'll support you. A- after they saw me on Broadway and saw uh, and saw some of the professional major professional things I did. I think it was quite clear to them that I made the right choice. (laughs) Now, you spent time in Vietnam. Your time as a combat infantryman in Vietnam was very rough and dramatic. You were actually one of the last people to be evacuated after the Battle of Fire Support Base Ripcord. And you were awarded the Bronze Star for Valor for retrieving important radios so they wouldn't fall into enemy hands. First of all, sir, thank you for your service. Thank you. You often play strict, authoritarian, strong-willed characters who are men in powerful positions. Do you sometimes draw from your experiences in the army when you're creating those characters? Sometimes, vaguely. I mean, I, I, I mostly was with a bunch of other grunts. And so when I play a general, I have to make an, a, an imaginative leap. But the one thing that Vietnam combat experience gave me was the play, How I Got That Story, in which there was one actor playing a newsman trying to get the story of how how we got into this. And there was another actor who played every other person in Vietnam who he connects with, of three races, of both sexes, And because I had met those people or people like them, I had this stored Rolodex in my head of uh, people who were connected to Vietnam in one way or another, the good guys and the bad guys. And that really gave me my start as a dramatic actor in New York. And also during one of the performances, after one of the performances, Alan Pakula came backstage and said, I'd like you to do a movie with me. And that was the beginning of my film career, too. So Vietnam, which had basically taken me out of my course to to get to New York for at least a year, a little over a year, ended up being this great gift given to me. And also it was like psychodrama. It was something that uh, I was able to process a few things that I hadn't uh, up until then. And so it's, you know, there's something good in even the worst experience, if you can digest it, if you survive it and digest it and are lucky. And I was, uh, I think I was all of those three. If you're a coffee lover like me, it's always fun to discover a great new blend. I recently found a terrific new company, Breakfast at Dominique's, that's created a series of coffee blends to honor the legacies of the greatest Hollywood legends. And I'm thrilled to tell you that now, Breakfast at Dominique's has introduced the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend. It's my very own exclusive, delicious, bold, rich, balanced, medium roast coffee, and I just know you're going to love it. It's made from high quality organic beans produced using fair trade practices. If you'd like a great cup of coffee, give Breakfast at Dominique's a try and order the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend at hollywoodblends.com. They'll ship it right to your door anywhere in the world. Sipping our coffee is the perfect way to watch our show. 
So when you were first starting out as a performer, who were your role models in, in the theater world? Well, the number one one was John Barrymore. Oh. I read every biography of him. I, I got all of his movies on videotape. And uh, after I had uh, I'd done a couple of shows on, on Broadway and Hal Prince's casting director called me in uh, to replace John Cullum in On the 20th Century, which to me is John Barrymore. His name is Oscar Jaffe, but screw that. He's John Barrymore in my uh, little head. And I couldn't believe I was going to have this chance, even though the show was closing. It would be like three months or something. So I went in and I banged the gong, I think. And and Joanna did too. And But she said, you know, I got to tell you that Hal is probably going to give this to the gentleman who has uh, stood by the entire run, who's also a Facebook friend of mine now. But he would like to see you for his next musical, which is going to be Evita. Wow. And, you know, I settled for that, somewhat <laughs> disappointed. And then, of course, that was a, a genesis of a whole another level for me. But the kicker is I came to California after 20 years in New York. I was doing films, television, and there was an outfit out here called Reprise. And they do revivals, like for a couple of weeks, of major Broadway musicals. They were... They were slated to do on the 20th century with a young man, and he fell out for one reason or another. I don't know. So they called me. I had done Follies for them the year before. So they called me, and at last, at last, I was going to embody my my spirit actor in, in that, and I played opposite Carolee Carmelo, who's fantastic. And because I'm a little older... There was a, a there was a a different emotion that was in this, which was another level of desperation, because as if I think I was fifty five or something like that around that time. Not only was Lily his career, it, she was his life, his last chance to ever have the love of his life, who understood him, who put up with him, and vice versa. And so that that gave a whole impetus to it that that isn't necessarily there in the script. There's a lot of other things, but that that age thing isn't quite there. And it was very successful. And I, I'm just delighted. And I, I happened to and I can't say where I got it, but I someone did uh, do a recording of it. And so I've been able to show some very select people what I did because they couldn't see it. And I am as proud of that as I am of Shawshank Redemption or Evita or anything else I've ever done because I got to be my guy. And I know he was a tragic figure in a lot of ways, but I still watch many of his movies on uh, uh, classical movie stations, TCM, etc. And I, I just find him fascinating. Well, he... He was a fascinating actor, but I'm glad that you were able to channel and harness all of the lessons you learned from his acting without all of the demons that plagued his personal life. So bravo. <laughs> you. Now, you know, as I mentioned in my introduction, you've played a lot of real people throughout your career, including at least three presidents and Juan Perón on Broadway and Secretary of State Cyrus Vance. What's your process for preparing to play a real person? Well, that to me is one of the great joys of, of particularly film acting, but sometimes on stage too, and that is to do the research on the person. And at some point, hopefully, something clicks and I internalize what I have, what has gone into my head, starts moving into my body. And I, I love what, what I guess I would call transformative acting, where you really are a, a, an entire different physical, emotional entity than your own uh, your own personality. 
And I would add Harry Truman to your list of presidents. <laughs> it was a little bit of a cameo for a for a television show, a cable show. But believe it or not, I, you know, and I played George Wallace at some point. And I watched some of these things and I, you know, they're flawed in some ways, but I, I really enjoy them, particularly uh, uh, the one that got the worst reviews. And that was Elvis Meets Nixon. I just thought of, it, it was a mock documentary. So there, there was a comic engine underneath it. And after we started listening and the, and the uh, tapes were all uh, divulged to the public, some of the obnoxious things that I did as Nixon in the movie turned out to be fairly uh, moderate compared to the real thing. And I love playing Nixon. I wrote a, a, an article for the LA Times about playing him. And there was, again, emotional thing. He was the guy whose signature was on my orders to Vietnam. And my dad had hated him all his life. We lived in California and he called him old bowel jaws. And so I went into it thinking, you know, I have to fall in love with this guy somehow. Because you, from my point of view, if you don't have some level of understanding, empathy, and hopefully love, it's very hard to take on a person and do it do it justice. And I found that, believe it or not, with Richard Nixon. I take from that that you do feel a special sense of responsibility to the person you're portraying. Absolutely. I, I know some actors abandon any effort to look or to behave like uh, the person they're playing. And to me, because physical reality is something that communicates character and uh, emotion every bit as much as voice and lines uh, that I it just, it's my own choice to try and get as close as I can to what I think through my research and through my intuition and, and sometimes from viewing lots and lots of, of film of any person that I try to get as close to that as I can. And sometimes it, it, uh, like with, with Perron, when I auditioned for Hal Prince, I walked on stage in boots, big knee up to your knee boots, and it made me walk in kind of a stiff way. And I uh, saw this regal pose that on some films of Juan Perón. And I also saw a little thing, but when he smiled, his tongue was behind his upper teeth very often. And that's how you do when you're not smiling inside, but you have to smile on the outside. You have to hold it in place. And, I, you know, stupid things like that, but stupid to other people. But to me, they're little keys, the little uh, uh, doorways, little passageways into character. Since you're talking about uh, Juan Perón and Evita, you were the original Juan Perón on Broadway in 1979. And for a while, when Oliver Stone and then Ken Russell were going to direct the movie, it looked like you were going to be in the movie version. Why didn't it happen? Well, they were only two of the lineup of directors who were considered. Some even got further along in the pre-production thing, and they ended up going the way of the world. With Oliver, he teased me. I did a couple of movies for him, small roles, and a, 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 also a miniseries. And he would always kind of tease me, dangle that in front of me. But I think he really would have considered somebody like Raul Julia. So I don't know how serious he ever got. But, but Ken, on the other hand, they flew me to uh, London to do some scenes with uh, the London original, Elaine Page. And we had a ball. And the, all of the word was that, okay, and they're going to get the original guy who did Che, and that's what it's going to be. And I thought Ken Duncan was kind of a mind-blowing choice to do that movie. It would have been very unconventional, I'm sure. 
But it got me a ride on the SST. I spent a day with Elaine walking through London because when we got there, there was a transit strike. And so we had to get out of our limo carrying our wardrobe and we walked all the way back to our hotel. And she pointed out where she studied and uh, over here is this. And it was just a one, and it was a beautiful day. So that was almost a compensation for eventually not uh, having a crack at that. Well, we'll never know what it would have turned out to be, but you certainly made up for it. I, I'm sure you're well aware, Mr. Gunton, that you are something of a cult hero because of your performance as Captain Benjamin Maxwell in an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation called The Wounded. Do you enjoy all the attention you get from Star Trek fans? You know, they are so fervent and so knowledgeable and many, many of them are attracted not just to the to the idea of it, but to the the ethical focus of of that series on real moral and ethical questions. And the the episode I did was high among those. And uh, many of them, I've, I've gone to conventions and signed stuff. They carry books that are like compendiums uh, with, that has every episode. And every character listed, and they ask you to sign your character. And uh, all of us are rather, think of it as somewhat sacred. It's not just another show. So, yeah, I, I enjoy being around them a lot. And what about working with Robin Williams in Patch Adams? Do you have any memories from working with him that you can share with us? I have many, many memories, but I'll, I'll give you two. He, he knew my background about Vietnam and all that. So he asked me out. We were in North Carolina shooting part of the movie there. And he said, could you come with my wife and we'll have dinner tonight? And I was, you know, I was delighted. And I expected to be a rollicking, you know, spit take around the table kind of a thing. And it wasn't. He was so serious, so well read, so philosophical in depth about things. And it was fascinating. On the other side of the coin, when we were shooting a big scene near the end of the movie where basically he's on trial to whether or not he's going to stay in the hospital and do his thing. And it was set up like a courtroom, and there was a, a balcony where all of the people who loved him were all up there. And so we'd shoot the dramatic parts of the thing, and then they'd say, cut, okay, we're going to move the camera. Robin would swivel around and ask for someone to throw out a word. And I remember one word that somebody threw out was Viagra. And for the next 20 minutes, we were treated to this uh, totally off the cuff ad lib, you know, his thing. And all of us were just hysterical. And we'd go back to shoot some more scenes and all of us would be rubbing our stomach because they it hurts so much. But he's a brilliant guy. He's a wonderful guy. And it's a great tragedy that that like Barrymore in a way, that there was a, a, a darkness that, I, I guess, helped overtake him. Uh, what, I, what he actually had was a disease. So it, it wasn't his drug thing or, or anything like that that really brought the end near. Oh, uh, we miss him, show business, and I miss him just as a person that uh, exchanged Christmas cards with, things like that. He was, he was a great man. Yeah, he was a real genius, and I'm so glad you got to work with him. Now, of course, I have to ask you a few questions about The Shawshank Redemption. It's certainly the movie that you're most identified with. You know, Mr. Gunton, when I watch your performance, it seems to me that you were somehow able to intuit the character of the warden, and you clearly understood the nuanced psychology of that man and his complicated need to retain a kind of a pathological domination over Andy. Were you channeling any specific person in that performance as the warden? I was actually cha channeling besides what Stephen King and Frank Darabont 
had created. And uh, I, it was interesting to know that in the original King novella, there were three different wardens. So making uh, in the movie just one warden absolutely identified him as the antagonist. There was no dilution of that. It was, and, and I saw that as the light and the dark and the dark trying to snuff out the light, but the light cannot be snuffed out. That's sort of the, you know, metaphysical part. But the actual moment to moment scenes and acting largely came from a a biography that I wrote and a, a backstory and a very thorough one. And so in it, in that story, I plugged in events in my Samuel Norton that that had emotional weight to them, that uh, a betrayal here or uh, shame there or being called stupid, in other words, obtuse, and how all of these things triggered in him the mask that he wore as this simple kind of Presbyterian minister, harsh, but fair, and put your trust in the Lord, your ass belongs to me. That too was a key to, to uh, seeing the bifurcation in him. And of course, all of it is revealed as little by little, his power of darkness just can't bear the light. So I, I think that had as much to do with being able to, in the moment, have the emotional button there to be pushed. And it's the first time I'd ever done that in that kind of, that extensively from his childhood to how he ended up as warden of Shawshank. And I've done it uh, other times in kind of a, you know, uh, brief outline thing, but this was a full out biography. Mr. Gunton, when I, when I was a criminal court judge for 26 years before I retired, I, I knew men that. like that, men who were fervently attracted to the institution of the criminal justice system and I always felt they had this need to repair something that was irredeemable inside them. And that's how I felt when I watched you as the warden. Well, that's that aligns with his biography that I wrote. That's very much, I'm, I'm happy to hear that because sometimes what we come up with in the, in the privacy of our makeup room never gets out past the audience. And part of it is, I knew this was going to be an important role because of the antagonist. And because he is the antagonist, he would get, that character would get what very few of the characters I've played do get. And that is a medium close-up or even a real close-up. And as far as I'm concerned, without those, you're basically part of the scenery. You may bring in some information, something might bounce off of you or you might be there for a reaction but the audience isn't seeing the wheels turning and the, of the and the mask coming down again or or having cracks in it and because that was a primary character uh, i got those things and i think that's one reason why uh, that character has been so important to people, he's not just the bad guy, there's something else going on is what they very often tell me. So I'm, I'm, I'm proud, I'm glad you noticed that. Uh, I appreciate that, Harvey. Well, I was amazed to read that initially the people at Castle Rock were not in favor of you playing the role of the warden because they didn't think you were a big enough star. I can't even imagine anyone else in that role. Did you ever find out who you were up against? Well, they were very abstemious about oh. saying anyone's particular, any one particular actor. But it was quite clear that some of the big guys who have already played wardens, some of them who have since passed away, would have loved to have done them in the same way that Tom, uh, not Tom Cruise, Tom, our Tom, the nice guy, 
really wanted to play Andy and was someone's choice at Castle Rock. But Frank had very, very precise notions of what he wanted. And from him, he, as soon as I walked in and started reading the lines, he saw something. And unfortunately, initially, the producers at Castle Rock did not. So they bargained and they said, okay, we'll give him a screen test. So I was doing Demolition Man at the time. And I was, as you may remember, totally bald. And it wasn't a bald pate thing. It, he shaved my head. So I knew I didn't want to play that character of the warden with a bald head because the hair is going to be sort of a marker of the passage of time, which it turned out to be. And so they had some wonderful woman in the San Fernando Valley put together, weave a wig for me, which is that very much that combed, nice, combed, neat Presbyterian minister. And uh, so I wore that for the, for the screen test. And Tim was there off camera reading the line, reading his lines. So it wasn't someone sitting there and, uh, oh, yes. Oh, uh, Warden. I'll tell you, you know, you didn't have to deal with that. You, this is the guy. And when they saw that, it was, you know, they said, oh, yeah, we'll do that. How many times in your career have you had the luxury of shooting a movie in sequence like you did with Shawshank? I can't remember any other one. Really? It, yeah, no. And it was crucial to not just technically because they had to go would have to go back and forth between the aging things the hair things and makeup things and it would be time costly but it was also a, a matter of us getting to know each other at least the, the, the ones who I, I i didn't get to know anybody as the warden very much but we all read together but over the course of the movie those particularly the other prisoners, had these personal relationships and ticks and backstories uh, as just human beings that filled and enriched all of their performances. And the same was true with uh, Andy uh, and Red, that by the time we were done, they were where their characters needed to be. So it was a great luxury and a wonderful experience to do that. Well, you know, because of the incredibly huge and devoted following that the movie has, I mean, it's almost like a religious experience watching that movie. A lot of people don't realize that The Shawshank Redemption was not a commercial success when it first came out, even after it got seven Oscar nominations, correct? Correct. Was re-released. Nada. Why do you think the movie took so long to find its audience? Well, I, you know, there's all kinds of theories. The first one being Shawshank Redemption. What the hell does that mean? Oh, the title. The title. The original title in the novella is Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption. But they weren't going to use that because other than her picture, Rita Hayworth does not appear in the movie. So they said that the title was off-putting for some reason. Redemption sounds like, uh, you know, a holy roller thing. But when Ted Turner bought all of those stations and had all of them, had to fill them up, he started rotating Shawshank. And he had bought the uh, studio that made Shawshank, too. And so he started putting it in rotation. And it was like a virus, a good one that spread, and eventually it spread all over the world. I've been to, I think, five continents, Australia, South America, North America, Europe, and some parts of Asia, or no, actually of Africa. And every place I go, particularly when I was younger, but still to this day, people will come up to me and get that look in their eyes that this is this is someone they don't want to mess with and you know i'm a pretty happy-go-lucky guy but they are really paying tribute to a movie that they 
consider a religious experience. And I, I'm very moved by it. And I'm, uh, I, I try and be as gracious as possible because I'm, I understand that this is something that means a lot to a lot of people. It's not just fandom. Uh, when I was doing a, a movie in Chile, the 33, I, I got lost in, uh, in one of the cities. And I asked a, a guy if he could point me to a particular restaurant that I was trying to find. And he eventually got a cab driver to show me. Before he did, he said, Or am I being obtuse? Robert Gunton. <laughs> Number one, that that line from the, the movie. Number two, this guy 6,000 miles away knew my name. And there's a lots and lots of people in our country who says, you know, that guy, that's as close as they get to my actual name. And I was just floored by that. And it just shows you, it just took, there's something in it that is so basic to human nature. And my own theory is that it's about how friendship can be redemptive. How these two men, Red and Andy, saved each other's lives in the long run and then got to celebrate it. And I think that's just such a, a wonderful story and a deep one. Most people have friends that they say, you know, if it wasn't for George, I wouldn't have made it through that. Or And particularly women. I wondered why women came up to me about this movie. They understand better than, than men do how transformative a close friendship can be. Well, you know, I find it interesting that a lot of great movies and plays are about redemption. And of course, several characters in the movie find redemption. But for you personally, was there something redemptive for you in playing the role of Warden Sam Norton? Well, at the end, we wanted to make it unclear whether he was going to shoot, try and shoot his way out because he's, he's loading the pistol and putting the bullets in and they're knocking at the door. And for a while you think, oh, geez, he's going to go up against this bevy of cops. And I had asked Frank and the uh, property person to put a picture of my wife on the desk. And it was in line with the, with the thing that she had knitted or whatever you call it judgment comes in that right soon whatever whatever that black said so at some point i turn and i look at my wife and i think what will be the consequences of shame disgrace financial problems just sheer shame and guilt it finally arrives on him even though he gets through commanding, killing people and all the other stuff he does, finally that arrives. And for him, there's no way out. And that's why he kills himself. So I guess that's a, it's not a redemption so much as a just a, a final culmination of, okay, I know who I am. You've played a lot of roles in your career. Is is the warden your favorite role, the role you're proudest of? I'm proud of it. I'm proud of the work I did. I am humbly, humbled and grateful that I was ever a part of it. I enjoyed the making of it. But in, in a way, there's there's been little movies where I would do some little thing that I just thought was really neato. And again, I would be watching for it, and the rest of the audience would be over looking at this. And so there's a couple like that that I, I treasure. But I think in general, yeah, the Shawshank Redemption is... I used to think if on my tomb, they might scribble something about Evita. And it may turn out to be now that it's uh, going to be Warden Norton, oh. not one of own. <laughs> well, one of the other roles that I loved is your performance as Leland Owsley, the super villain Wall Street financier in Daredevil. It's very unique because that character is based on a comic book character. I read that you were able to identify with him because of your Irish Catholic upbringing. What did you mean by that? 
I don't remember saying that. So I don't know where that came from, but just a, a, a note to uh, your viewers. There's a wonderful mashup of Leland Owsley's deeply sarcastic, wise-ass answers and comments all mushed together in one two-minute reel on YouTube, and it's hysterical. And you, this guy's a, a coward, and, and he thinks he's better than everyone else. He thinks he's smarter than anyone else. And you see that's not the case. <laughs> Well, you know, although you're usually identified with playing tough, sinister characters, you've demonstrated some very impressive comedic skills in Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls, and of course on TV in Comedy Zone and Greg the Bunny. Would you have liked to have done more comedies in your career so far? I would have liked to have done several years of Greg the Bunny. We, all of us, enjoyed that show so much, and the cast members, a wonderful cast. The puppeteers were uh, brilliant. And it's another case where, you know, they'd say cut and, okay, we're going to move the camera. And they'd go on with their characters and fight and, and make love and all kinds of weird things. And again, we would just be hysterical and then have to go and do a, a scene. I thought it was a wonderful show. I thought it was totally unique. And Fox, I think, thought it was too unique. And uh, we only aired three of the 13 episodes that we shot. And uh, that's one of those shows where if I'm at a convention, people will come up and, and say, nah, I love this, I love it, but Greg the Bunny. And now it's going to be about three minutes of film that I did quite recently. And that is to recreate Egon Spengler in the latest Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters Afterlife. I guess it's been out enough. I'm not, I'm not destroying any secrets that, first of all, Harold Ramis died some years ago. He was beloved by his cast and by fans and by movie makers for the wonderful work he did. He died, as we all say, far too young. And in order to do this movie, Jason, uh, the director, felt he had to finish something with Egon Spengler. And in the movie, Spengler has died, and he's he, he ran away somewhere, deserted his kid, and his grandkids never got to meet him. So at the climax of the movie and through my acting and the magic of some wonderful tweaks they did to make me look like him or to make me look like the older Egon Spengler with the beard and, and things that he didn't have in the other movies, I arrive as a ghost to help my granddaughter kill all the bad ghosts. And more importantly, he is able to, and wordlessly, because he's that's all he's he's an apparition, wordlessly be reconciled with his daughter. And it's a wonderful moment. Harold's family agreed to it before the thing was filmed. And then when they saw it, they were just delighted with it. And so for a lot of people, that is that's something very, very important to them because Harold was very important to them. And on Twitter and other places, they thank me for helping bring him back for this final scene. Yeah, that's really very poignant and, and quite moving. And I'm so glad you got to do that. You know, when I look at your work on television, you've done a lot of guest appearances and TV movies over the years. But when you're a regular on a TV series, you get the chance to really grow into and develop the evolution of a character over a period of time. You were able to do that very briefly in Hot House in 1988, and then in Courthouse in 1995, and then Greg the Bunny and Desperate Housewives in the early 2000s, but only for brief periods. So is it fair to say that you didn't really get the chance to live inside a character for a lengthy period of time until 24? 24 was certainly the apotheosis of, of that uh, situation of growing into a character. First of all, 
Cherry, who played the president, and I had done a movie together, The Perfect Storm, and had gotten to know each other. We knew each other from New York because she, before then, was mostly a theater actress. So getting to invited back after doing a couple of shows as the Secretary of Defense, invited back to be her chief of staff. And we all know from current history that the chief of staff is a very crucial part of any presidential administration. And the uh, the connection that we already had is kind of offhand thing. And so it, just the one year that I played the chief of staff was really, I think people really got to take the measure of it, uh, Ethan. But the thing is, nobody knew whether Ethan, Ethan was going to be the mole. Because you go into, to, uh, in 24, you'd go into a season and your character would initially be described. They'd still be writing episode four, episode five. And invariably, somebody who starts out as, you know, uh, a nice guy or a nice woman ends up being the mole that ends up being the one that they eventually have to get rid of. So all of us kind of went on the set wondering, and you can't play that. And it's actually good because the best kind of, of spies and moles, uh, you would never think. It's a thing you hear, oh, I've never thought I'd ever see that that happen to him. So fortunately, I made the cut and didn't have to uh, go to nefarious extremes. And but you're you're right. That's that's one of the few times when I really got to feel like I, I, it was a three dimensional character. And again, because of TV, you get more close ups and people can see what you're thinking and see perhaps what you're feeling or what you're what feelings you're trying to hide. But it was great fun to do. I, I loved it. Um, and it, it was a great experience. Would you like to be a regular on another long-running series? Well, at this point... Well, you're I'm, not quite there yet. I, I tell people that I was tempted to change my SAG after name to Hoot Geezer <laughs> and hope I get to do some more Western. <laughs> I, I think I'm almost at the Gabby Hayes point, but uh, yeah, if it's the right, if it's the right thing, I, I would prefer to be a kind of a drop-in character, a, a recurring character. Uh, I don't think I want to do the, particularly in a television series that you know you actually work five days a week, the all day, and movies. Of course, you have days off and maybe just part of a day and all that. But actually, I went back to theater last summer after not having done a dramatic play in decades. And I was once again, I'm once again marveled at the power of being on stage, of being having two or three weeks of rehearsal to so everybody knows what they're doing and where they are and how they feel. And then there's still room to discover more on stage. And I was just, it was no money, basically. And I played a Jewish Holocaust survivor, believe it or not. And I think it's some of the best acting I ever did. And no, not very many people saw it. it. Was We did it in Southampton on Long Island. But we had survivors come to see it. And of course, they're little by little diminishing to a very small number but it's called the soap myth and that's what it was about the fact that the nazis making soap out of jewish flesh and particularly women's was is was still considered a un something they could not verify in in paper and signature and history and all that, which many of the other atrocities were documented. And I play a survivor who knows that was a fact. He witnessed bars of soap being given Jewish burials. He had one in his hand. And then at the very end, he tells his story. And it's just... 
So I, I, I think if, if I remain healthy and strong enough, I might like to do some more stage work. Well, amen to that. And I hope that play, The Soap Myth, becomes more well-known because I had never heard of it. And it sounds very important because this has been substantiated that the Nazis did that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, of all the roles you've played, is there one that most closely resembles the real Bob Gunton? Well, I think uh, Ethan Kanan in 24 is pretty close to to me. I, I mean, it's because it was, I didn't know where they were going with it. And I didn't want to preclude being the bad guy if it turned out to be that. But I think his reasonability, his, his deference, and also his spine when things got dicey and I'd like to think there was a lot of me in Ethan. I, I think that's that's one of the closest that I can recall. You've worked with some great directors, Oliver Stone, I think three times, Clint Eastwood, Philip Noyce, Frank Darabont, Taylor Hackford, John Woo, David O. Russell. There's so many. Is there a particular directorial style that resonates with you the best? Yeah. Uh, I enjoy being directed. Now, now, a lot of actors just see, say, uh, "Just you know, if you have to cut something, go ahead, but let me do my thing. I love to do my thing and then, okay, now how can we make that better? And I have to say a lot of directors who come from advertising or, you know, that, that non-feature world, are reluctant to do that, particularly with actors that they feel have a, more experience at it than they do. But I love to be directed. And I have loved working with female directors. And part of that is I think they have easier access to emotional truth than many men have, particularly men in, in our business who uh, have lots of other things, Take on set, you've got, you know, all of this money going down the drain and so many people to, you know, wrangle. But uh, uh, there's a couple of times that I've, I've worked with women, Susan Feidelman, for, one, for instance. And also for me, and this works on stage even more, when I'm directed by a female, there's something in me that is, in a way, trying to seduce the director. And, of course, that translates to seducing the audience, in a way. And doesn't mean sexually, but to draw them in and say, ooh, that's interesting. Oh, I want to know more about that. And uh, I, I get that kind of energy from some, from some male directors, but mostly from, uh, from female. That's so fascinating. What about when you're directed by an actor like Ben Affleck, who directed Argo? Being directed by actors who know their stuff is great because the, the language, you share the same language, you have some of the same touchstones, and they can see when problems pop up because they've been through them too. So generally speaking, the ones I've, I've worked for like Ben have been terrific. Are there times you will agree to be in a movie or a TV show because of the people you'll be working with, even if you're not that crazy about the script or the role that you'll be playing? Well, for many years, I didn't have the luxury of being all that choosy. I did some movies that helped me send my daughter to Yale that, that in some cases paid for my theater work when I was not making a great deal on stage. But I, I, I have been lately anyway, a, a lot more choosy and reluctant to get involved in something that is just, you know, I've done that a lot of times. And I get those requests because because of Shawshank Redemption, they have put that puss on on film. We got our bad guy. And and that that puts me in a kind of a cramped place. I, I would never say, oh God, they They've typecast me because I don't feel that's been the case. I feel that sometimes they don't because I'm not 
typecast. They don't know exactly where I fit in. And so when I go into audition, that's always an interesting challenge for me to make them forget Warden Norton and let them have a glimpse at John Doe or whoever it is that they're thinking about casting me as. That shouldn't be difficult when one looks at your list of credits. I saw a wonderful movie. You played Meryl Streep's husband in Rendition. I'd love to see the two of you work together again, wouldn't you? Well, we did our Broadway debut together in a musical called Happy End. I was low man on the totem pole. It was my first, first Broadway show, first big show in New York. And neither of us had been originally the leads, but the male lead injured his knee. And, and he said, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. And I looked at him, I said, he ain't fine. He's not going to be able to do the things he has to do on stage tomorrow. And we open two or three days. This was at Brooklyn Academy. So I went home and, and I had only taken the job as the one line character if they gave me understudy to the lead. And these folks didn't know that for years I had done the entire Rodgers and Hammerstein canon, musical, original musicals, all of this stuff. I To them, I was the guy banging the drum. So I, I get to the theater uh, the next morning and Bob Calvin, who was by then the director, said, you know, I, I think we're going to have to shut down. Chris is really... Uh, very, he's injured. It's going to take a while for him to get back. And I said, show me the blocking. And his eyes lit up and he showed me the blocking. We did a rehearsal. I went on that night as Bill Cracker, the toughest guy in Chicago. And by then, Meryl Streep had replaced the woman who had started out, Shirley Knight. And she she's a wonderful singer besides actress and besides person and when she saw that she was now playing opposite someone who could sing the shit out of songs when called to sometimes even when not called to her, her she was very delighted by that and uh, we became close for a very short time because the sunday after we opened on broadway I remember my then wife and I went to Sardi's and we got the standing up thing led by Eli Wallach and his wife. Oh, wow. uh, so I was in heaven, but I felt weird. And I woke up the next morning and I was covered with a rash. I went to the doctor. It was rubella measles. Oh. I could no longer be on stage around anybody. The entire cast had to get gamma globulin shots or whatever they uh, do. And I was out. And they brought, back, because it, it had been pretty well received, they brought Chris back on crutches. And he played the rest of the show on crutches. I no longer bang the drum. I got a very nice fee for being his standby rather than his understudy. And so I, I didn't end up doing it but I, it was my performance that was seen by the critics. So anyway, Marilyn and I shared that. She came and saw how I got that story because her brother was a choreographer for it. And then many years later, this is one of the times when there's really no role for her husband. She wanted to have a husband. She wanted to show the domestic side of this character. So I got to spend an afternoon in bed with Meryl Streep. And we reminisced, and I reminded her of something that had happened during Happy End that I felt so terrible about, but now I think it's funny. Uh, I wanted my Bill Cracker to have a mustache, you know, like, like a 30s guy. And uh, so I started growing one, and then I had to pencil it in because it was kind of a wussy one. So I darkened it. So in the midst of the show, there's this big kiss that they do. And this was during rehearsal, thank God. <laughs> and so we do that and back away. And I see across her lip <laughs> this dark smudge. And the whole cast 
breaks out into laughter. And Meryl, for the first time since I had known her, was not laughing because she knew she was being laughed at, that she was not in control of the laughter. And of course, eventually she got it and brushed it off and, and did joke about it. But her initial reaction was, and I told her when we were filming rendition, I said, that's the most vulnerable I've ever seen you, except for when she played the Holocaust survivor in uh, Sophie's Choice. Yeah. Then I saw her whittle down to just pure grief. And she understood I was paying her a great compliment based on a, a silly episode. But and, and when I had to leave because of rubella, she was also uh, weird. We had kind of an opening night champagne on stage stuff, and she didn't stay for it. And it was only a good deal later that I learned that her lover had just been diagnosed with the cancer that eventually killed him. Oh. And so she was, he was carrying that on stage. I was carrying rubella. But I love her. He is a great woman, and I don't need to say it, a great, great actress and performer. Yeah, I think eventually we're going to see the perfect vehicle for the two of you. I can envision it. I want to tell you something. I, I was recently watching an old BBC interview with Orson Welles. He did it in the 70s, and he said something that really struck me. He said, Hollywood has destroyed or diminished almost every great artist who ever came within its clutches. But Mr. Gunton, you've had a very productive and fulfilling and long career, and you seem to have maintained your sense of balance and perspective in an industry that by all accounts can be brutal. What do you think has been the key for you in sustaining your resilience and remaining so grounded? Well, I've had my moments. After I did Sweeney in New York, I felt like I had climbed Mount Everest. I, I loved doing it, but it was just, it was exhausting and emotionally in all other ways. And that was when my wife and I decided to move to LA. I looked around and I didn't see anything on Broadway other than what we had done that attracted me in the least. And so I came out to, to LA thinking, well, I'm going to be kind of a journeyman actor. I'm going to make a lot more money than I ever could on Broadway. And I'm going to raise my kid and she's not going to have to see people get killed on the subway, which did happen. But the, the thing that, that eats away at a lot of us is this, what is called rejection thing that we uh, explain to people that I'll be, go up for 25 auditions and I'll get one gig out of that at some point. It's not quite the same now, but initially it was certainly that. And I had to learn how to, cope with that sense of rejection. And I found for me that the answer was to bring a gift to every audition, a, an insight, a, a take on the character, a, a, a minor analysis of some moment, which demonstrates that I understood the piece, but also something that my, I never thought of that. And if I can end up walking out of there having delivered my gift, then something has been accomplished. It's, it, was, it wasn't yelling into the wind. And believe it or not, that, that is something that for many years helped me work through that rejection syndrome. There's a lot of wisdom in that. Do you have any plans to sit down and write a memoir? I mean, you've I had have, such a career. I have written one. You have written it? Yes, it's. Uh, I finished it a couple of years ago. I have yet to submit it or find an agent or publisher. I've had some people in the business and out, uh, outside of it read certain chapters, and they think it's it's fabulous. And I did actually. My agent, my theatrical agent, submitted it to someone he knows in New York, who is a publisher. And he said, yeah, I like this, but everything is now politics. And this was back right after uh, Trump was elected. So all of these the, the people were fighting to get their take on what, you know, how we were blowing ourselves up. 
So I still want to uh, shop it around. I think I'm a little chicken about it. But I will tell you the title, at least my working title. It's quotation mark dot dot dot. Or am I being obtuse? <laughs> question mark. <laughs> so that serves two things. It, it gives me an out if there are some things people disagree with. But also it reminds them, oh, that's a guy from Shawshank. Oh, oh, I cannot wait to read that memoir. I, and I hope you'll come back when it comes out to promote it, because we would love to have you back. I'd be happy. I, I want to tell you something, Mr. Gunton. It's often said that in show business, you're only as good as the last thing you've done. But I believe that you're as good as the best thing you've ever done. And you, sir, are as good as many of the greatest Broadway shows, movies, and TV shows we've ever seen, thanks to you. It's Thank been an you. enormous honor and a pleasure meeting you and having this chance to discuss your amazing career. Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. My pleasure. And may I say, your friend and mine, Luke Yankee, described what this was like and described who you were. And he was absolutely spot on. You are the most well-read and, and uh, familiar with a body of work that I have ever dealt with. And sometimes it's, so uh, did anything happen that was funny on Shashank? And you go, yay. But your questions are 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 pointed, and uh, I'd be happy to come back anytime. I'm glad we could do this. That's a huge honor. Thank you so much for those beautiful comments. Our guest has been the brilliant, iconic actor, Bob Gunton. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my PR director, Laurie Towers, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.